We're going to be finishing this chapter today, been in this chapter for a number of weeks now, and uh, um, wanted to just give you just a short thought, a couple of applications today as we dive into the second miracle that Jesus did um, that is recorded here in the book of John, in John chapter 4, picking up in verse number 46, John in chapter number 4, verse 46. Let's read to the end of the chapter, and then let's just, just let's go through and, and take a look at a couple of applications here as, um, as we have this time of evening worship. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he had heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, will ye not believe? The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house. This again, this is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. I believe the simplest way we can define faith is this, taking God at his word and acting upon it. Faith does not hinge on understanding, but on obedience. Understanding comes afterwards. When we look back and see the hand of God leading us and guiding us into his perfect will. We use the expression all the time, hindsight is what? 2020, isn't it? It's true. As I look back and review how God has moved in my life, I, I see um, what was then the hidden hand of God moving in my life. I don't know about you and your Christian life, your Christian experience, as you've stepped out in faith and you've trusted God to do the impossible and you've said, I don't know how this is going to work. I don't know, um, you know what we're going to be able to do to make this thing happen. And then you turn around maybe a year later, two years later, and you go, wow, look what God's done. And you go, I didn't understand it then but I'm certainly glad I obeyed. I didn't understand, but you know what? I'm certain glad I stepped out in faith. I think for me, as I look back over the nine years here at Okanagan Valley Baptist Church, there have been so many, so many. But as I think about this and as I kind of wrote that little introduction, um, I, I really thought about um, our bus ministry. And uh, I've been, I'm really bothered, sad that we can't run a full bus right now and and I can't wait to get back to, to running a full bus. But I thought, I don't know what it was. My wife has a better memory than I do. Must have been four or five years ago. Maybe not even that long. Maybe four years ago. I said, you know what would be great? If we were to start a bus ministry. We were like, man, how, where are we going to get a bus? Who are we going to get to run it? You know, her and I, we were tapped, man. I mean, we couldn't. Like, she's like, I, I wouldn't mind. She says, but man, I'm, I'm 100%. And I'm like, I get you. I'm, I'm at 100%. I didn't, know, I didn't know what to do, but we thought, man, it'd be really neat to be able to run a bus. My wife, as many of you know her testimony, she was saved off the bus ministry. Um, uh, uh, a bus came, and, and a bunch of workers knocked on her door. Her, her mom was like, yeah, you're going to babysit her for three hours? You're gone. <laughs> and, uh, and so, I mean, she rode the bus, and... and uh, uh, I think it was her and her sister. I don't know a couple other friends. And uh, uh, at nine years old, they were real rebels in, in children's class. They skipped out on children's class, and they came upstairs to the, to the preaching time. And it was during that that my wife got saved, and I believe Cindy got saved at the same time, right? So Crystal and Cindy got saved, and, and, uh, and shortly thereafter, uh, her mom got saved and, and, and baptized. It was really exciting. And, and now today, you know, my wife's in Canada here. She's from, originally from Spokane, Washington, born in, in uh, Rock Springs, Wyoming, but now uh, uh, here in Canada. And it's pretty amazing, actually, when you think about it, that, uh, you know, God took a, a girl, uh, saved off the bus ministry, right, and, uh, and brought her to Canada. And now she's been serving um, here in Canada for um, coming up 15 years, right? I mean, 15 years. 
been in Canada now, serving the Lord. Always knew at 12 years old that God had called her into the mission field. Uh, she didn't know where that mission field was, and it turned out to be Canada. And uh, we look back, and, and we can look back at, at steps of faith that we've taken. But I look at this bus ministry, I looked at my wife, she's like, yeah, it'd be really awesome. And, uh, and I don't remember the time frame, but shortly thereafter, um, I got a call by uh, a guy by the name of Joel Binberry. And Joel Binberry says, yeah, I got a van I'd like to donate to the church, and I'm going to come by on such and such a Sunday, and I'm going to donate it. And I'm like, okay, that sounds great. I'll meet you outside. And, and so he came into service that day. It was hilarious. Came into service that day and uh, came in late, so I barely got to say hi to him. I knew who he was. And he left. He left before the invitation ended. So I didn't even get to talk to him. So I walk out into the parking lot, and there's this 1993 GMC Safari van. There was no registration for it. There were no insurance papers for it. The seats were out of their holders, upside down, piled on top of each other. And I went, great, someone just dumped their stolen van on me. You know, I'm like, what in the world am I going to do with this thing? I'm like, Daryl, I guess this is the van that Joel and Daryl uh, brought away. And I looked in this and went, Whew. So we better call it into the RCMP. I did. I called it into the RCMP. I said, I think I might have a hot vehicle here. And so she, they said, give me the VIN. I gave the VIN that turned back that, you know, it wasn't stolen or anything. I'm like, okay, great. So what do I do with this? So anyway, got the insurance on it. And, uh, and then I'm like, still really didn't have anyone to drive it. I couldn't drive it. Crystal couldn't drive it. We were just, we were tapped. And uh, a young man, Lee, rode away. Um, says, you know what, Pastor? I think it's time for me to come home. And wouldn't it be nice if we started a bus ministry? I said, Brother Lee, I have a van for you to start. And uh, we started in that van. And uh, we got that van cleaned up. Daryl and I got that thing kind of spick and span and got her running. And, uh, and Lee started driving. We started knocking doors. And we filled that van. We're like, Pastor, we got a problem. We filled the van. So we started using, um, it was the Broadway's Ford Windstar, I think it was. We started using a second minivan. And we started running a second minivan. And then we filled the second minivan. And I'm going, wow, okay, I don't know what we're going to do next. And we just started praying, Lord, I guess we're going to need a van. And then somebody said, hey, I got a 12-passenger van. I'd love to donate to the church. And they donated it free to the church. We got a second vehicle given to the church. And we started running that. We filled that and had to go back to using a van. And then we got up to a school bus. And it's been amazing. Each step of the way, we're like, I don't, I, God wanted us to do this, but we didn't know what the next step was. But it was incredible how each time we were met with a need, God provided that. You see, that's what faith is. Faith is saying, God, I know that this is the step you want me to take. I don't have all the pieces, but I'm going to operate by faith. I'm going to step out, and I'm going to trust you to do the impossible. This is what I see in this account here. This man simply accepted what God said by faith, went his way, and there were some great things. I want you to see real quickly here this evening, three things. I want you to see a great need verse, um, in, in verses 46 and, uh, and 47. I look at the Bible, says here, let me turn back a page. He says, so Jesus came into Cana of Galilee, where he made water wine, and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Now, we see that Jesus here returns to Capernaum, he went up to Galilee, he's coming back down, and uh, or, or up from Galilee, he's coming back down into Cana, excuse me. And uh, I mean, you can imagine the fame of him. He turned all those water pots into wine, and, uh, and it was incredible. People were like, wow, this is amazing. And, uh, and, and no doubt his fame started to spread in that area. Well, they heard that Jesus was coming back, this nobleman. I don't know if he was a Jew. I don't know if he was a Gentile. We know that he was a ruler. He was a man of some status. Well, he heard that Jesus was coming, and he set out to meet Jesus. He knew that Jesus was going to be the answer. He knew that Jesus could help him. And he left Capernaum, and he was going to walk up to Cana. Now, I did some look, looking and, and some research here. Um, you know, uh, Capernaum to Cana is, you know, some, some people say it's around 8 to 12 miles. You know, you're looking at that, I don't know, 15 to 20 kilometers thereabouts. You know, it would have taken a man three to six hours to walk, depending on how fast he walked. It was a long walk, right? He probably, you know, he just headed up that way, all because he heard that Jesus was going to be there. And he confronts Jesus with this, um, with this problem in verse, um, verse 47. When he heard Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point 
of death. This was a serious sickness. This son was near the point of death. This man had nowhere to turn. He knew that Jesus performed this miracle in Cana. He turned the water. He turned it into wine. If there was anyone that could help, it was going to be Jesus. And he travels there. This man knew that Jesus was the answer and was willing to travel to see the Lord. And I'm here to remind you as we make some application, Jesus is the answer. Two questions I wrote down as I thought about this. Because we know that Jesus is the answer, will we take the time to go to Jesus? Maybe you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Will you understand that you are the one that is at the point of death? In fact, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, and Jesus is the only answer. Will you go to Jesus? Um, and, And I'm here to tell you that he invites you to come. The Bible says, ho, everyone that is thirsty, come. The Bible says, behold, now is the day of salvation. Behold, now is the accepted time. I'm so glad that the invitation has come to whosoever will may what? May come. And the invitation is there. Just like this man, he knew that Jesus was the answer. He knew that he could take his cares to Jesus. And, 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 and will we go to Jesus? Are you saved? Dear Christian, do you go to Jesus? I'm reminded kind of of a story that is almost the... Uh, Not the opposite of this, but remember the woman that was sick with the issue of blood? She spent all of her money, right, on the physicians, and they couldn't heal her. And as a last resort, as a last resort, it seems like she went to Jesus and touched the hem of his garment. Isn't that incredible? How many times, dear Christian, do you try every other recourse, and you're like, well, I guess there's always prayer. Haven't we done that before? Well, the last resort is prayer. I've tried everything else. I guess I'll pray about it now. Wait a minute. Whatever happened to prayer being the first resort? Huh? Whatever happened to say, let me take it to the Lord in prayer? I believe in our, in our, in our, in our Christianity today, we try to try everything else, and then we'll give Jesus a try. No, I'm glad for the faith of this man. He said, I don't know, my son's at the point of death. I know someone who can help. And he went to Jesus. Will you go in prayer? Will you go in obedience? Think about this in terms of our soul winning. If Jesus is the answer, will we go and point others to Jesus? We were talking here a little bit with the tech crew and and, and the cleaning crew as we were getting ready for this service. And, uh, you know, knowing the... The Bible says, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We don't hear much today, and and not that I preach on it often, but there is a hell, and it's still hot. There is a heaven, and it is still sweet. And, uh, And dear Christian, are we willing to go? Are we willing to travel like this man did, simply to go see Jesus? Are we willing to go and point others to the Lord Jesus Christ? Just saying today, this man had enough faith to say, Jesus is the answer, and I'm willing to go. And you know why he went? He didn't go for himself. He went on behalf of others. And I believe we need to have that same kind of heart. But then I want you to see this great lament. Not only there was a great need, but there was a great lament. Look what the Bible says here in verse 48. The Bible says, Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, will ye not believe? The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. Oh, there was a great lament. I, I used to read this, and, and it was, I, you know, I kind of thought like, wow, that was a pretty harsh response from the Lord. He's like, what? What, you're coming to me? Unless I do something you're not going to believe? It actually, when I read this, and I kind of read the whole account again, and, and the, really the humility of the nobleman in verse number 49, I don't believe this at all was a rebuke from the Lord. I actually believe it was a lament from the Lord. Not like, what, are you going to come to me just because I can do something for you? But it was actually like, oh, you know, uh, verse, verse 40, you know, verse 48, um, except you see signs and wonders, won't you believe? As though like, is this what it's going to take for you to believe? Wasn't this the same error, the same um, really sad state that Pilate was in? When he brought Jesus in, what did, what did Pilate want? He wanted to see Jesus do some miracle. He wanted to see something happen. Jesus was burdened when he looked over Israel. He said, oh, Israel, you you know, thou that killest the prophets. He said, how many times would I spread my wings over you like a hen her chicks, but you would not. You know, many times through Jesus' ministry, it was like, what can I get out of Jesus? 
Many started following. Why? Because of the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. Jesus was heartbroken. He said, unless you see something, will you not simply believe? This was not a rebuke, but a lament. And I thought about this. You know, so many people in their Christian life are looking for some sort of experience instead of just resting in Jesus. We have so many in the charismatic movement, they want the experience of whatever. And Jesus is like, am I not enough for you? Am I not enough for you just to rest in? Is my word not enough for you just to rest in? Hey, listen, I've had some great experiences in my Christian life. I have seen the taste of revival. I have seen the Holy Spirit move in meetings. I have, I have seen the brokenness in people. I have seen mighty workings, and I'm thankful for it. But you know what? It's during those quiet moments when it's just me and the Lord that it just seems like Jesus reaches out and he says, if you saw none of that until you come to be with me, am I enough for you? Am I enough that you would just sit and and read and learn about me? Am I enough that you would just fall in love with me through my word? What is the word of God? It's his love letter to us. Why are we constantly looking for the next spiritual high? I really believe we get the same response from Jesus. He says, am I not enough? What I reveal to you about me, my work on the cross, my demonstration of love to you, is that not enough for you just to to love me back? But I want that high, and, and we all like that high, and we all like that emotion. But will we just simply learn, as the psalmist David so sweetly put, that we would simply be still and know that I am God? What a beautiful thought that is. Jesus wasn't rebuking this man. He was simply like many other times in the gospel, saying, except you see signs and wonders, will you not believe? He kind of said it to his disciples, right? Many times we see the simple response of this nobleman. He said, sir, come down ere my child die. He said, I know, Jesus, I came to you because I knew you were the one that did this in Cana. He said, but please, would you come? And, 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 I, and I marvel, and I wish, boy, we could spend a lot of time here. But this man simply, look what the Bible says here in um, verse number 50. Jesus saith unto him, go thy way, thy son liveth. You know what I find beautiful about this? Look at what the next few, ver- next few words say. And the man believed the word. The man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him and went his way. He came to Jesus. Remember, this is a three to six hour walk. This is, you know, upwards between seven to 12 miles. Uh, And and Jesus says, he's come all this way. And and, and he says, you got to come. You got to come. And Jesus said, no, look, look, just go home. Your son's okay. The man went, fair enough. Believed what Jesus said. And went his way. What great faith. He simply said, Jesus, if you were able to turn the water into wine over here, I'm going to just take you at your word. And this man turned and left. Boy, what a great example of faith. I mean, the Bible says if we have faith, the grain of a mustard seed, we could say to that mountain, pick up hence and move. Jesus said about the fig tree, he said, this is nothing. If you, had, if you had just little faith, you'd be able to do this. I mean, this man had such faith in what Jesus said. Um, uh, he, he simply said, okay, and he, and, he, and, he, and he took Jesus at his word. In fact, I mean, I don't know this. I, 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 you read it here in verse 51. Um, uh, and he was going down, and as he was going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, thy son liveth. Uh, come down into verse 52. And he inquired of them the hour when he began to amend, and they said unto him, yesterday at the seventh hour. It seems to indicate that this man came to Jesus on one day. Maybe he left late in the day and got a late start and didn't want to travel back at night. <clears throat> but it sounds like he didn't go home right away, that he actually spent a full night 
maybe in Cana, before going home, because the Bible says when, when he came and the servants talked to him, he said, when did this happen? What happened yesterday? Now, come on, come on. How many of you like me, if someone said, you, you, know, you, you know, something great was going to happen, you'd be, okay, cool, I'll just spend the night here and go check. I'd be like, okay, let's go, let's go, let's move, move, move. I, I want to go check it out. I believe this man had such faith that what Jesus said he was going to do, he was going to do, he said, that's okay. And he spent the night, and it seemed like the next day he traveled back. Wow! Like, isn't, does that just astound only me here tonight? Am I the only one that, you know, when I know there's something waiting for me at the other end, I just want to get there and check it out? This man said, no, it was, it was yesterday. He spent all that time. All I'm telling you is this. He simply took Jesus at his word and acted upon it. Can I tell you this? We can take Jesus at his word. If Jesus said, you know what? I will build my church. Then guess what he's going to do? He's going to build his church. If he says the gates of hell ain't, ain't boy, I should be down in Kentucky or something. He said, if the, you know, if the gates of hell won't prevail against it, guess what? The gates of hell won't prevail against it. If he said he will never leave you nor forsake you, guess what? He will never leave you nor forsake you. If he says cast your care upon him, guess what? You can cast your care upon him. If he says he loves you, guess what? He loves you. But do we take Jesus at his word? Or do we look for something, as Jesus lamented, the experience to prove to me? It's, it's like after salvation, we're like, well, you need to prove to me you love me because your word isn't enough. Ouch. Oof. That stings. Well, if you don't answer my prayer, I guess you just simply don't love me. Well, no, he said he loved you. Is that enough? It should be. Because let God be true and every man be found a liar. Can I encourage you in something? Don't let your feelings, don't let your feelings usurp Jesus' words. An individual who lives their life based on feelings and experience is doomed to live a discouraged, defeated Christian life. You know what I do when I get most discouraged? I go back to Jesus' word. I, I tend to be, by nature, a fairly optimistic guy. I think I drive people nuts. I, I, I like to look on the bright side of things. I really do. But there are times where I get discouraged. I, and, and in these last few months, I shared a little bit from my heart. It just seems like I get tired. You know, I was telling another one of the men of the church, I said, you know what, I'm glad we've seen some souls saved here at the end of the year, and it's been good. But you know what, you know what, I just, I haven't seen sometimes what I hope to, and people getting saved and baptized and just things moving on. And I go, am I doing something wrong? Am I, am I not, am I just, is it me? Am I off? Is it COVID? Is it this? Is it that? I get discouraged. But you know what I have to do? I got to come back and I go, what did Jesus say? He said, I'll build my church. Don't you worry. You just be faithful. And you know what I can do? I can wake up the next day and go, it's all right. Jesus said he'll do it. And I'll let him do it. It's so much easier to let him do it. Does that mean I sit back? No, if you talk to my church family, there's no sitting back with Pastor Allen. The most scary words, you ask my tech crew, the most scary thing they ever say, they lose a hair or it goes gray every time. I go, hey, let's try something. I see them go white, ashen. What? Pastor, service starts in seven minutes. Yeah, let's just try it. Are you kidding? No, really, let's just try it. Four minutes and counting, you know? Uh, yeah, I know, just let's, let, let's just try something. I'd rather fail trying something for the Lord and then sitting back on my laurels. Let's just do something for God. He said he's going to build his church, so I just need to go soul winning. I need to knock on some doors. I need to hand out some fires. I need to pass out some gospel tracts. I need to preach, and I'll let him do the building. But man, I'll tell you, if you take it upon your shoulders, you'll be just like, what's the point? 
do we take Jesus at his word or do we need him to prove it to us? I think many times we're like, you need to prove it. We're like Gideon. I'm going to ask the Lord, how did Gideon make it into the, well, I guess Gideon made it in. I guess I wouldn't want to fight an army with 300. But he didn't start so well. Yeah, I'll go fleece dry, fleece wet, fleece in a bucket, you know, like he didn't start off as a great man of faith, but so many of us were like, okay, you got me, Lord, I'll go, but here's my fleece. What about just going? What about this man who just simply took Jesus at his word and had such faith that he was willing to spend the night before he went back to check on it? That's what faith is. That's what faith is. Faith is incredible. And as a result, look at this great miracle that took place in verse number 51. And as he was going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth. And this man went down and he said, I, 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 now, I, now I know. If he, if he had enough faith then when he got back, he said, truly, Truly, that is the Messiah, the Christ of God. He went down and, and it was confirmed by his servants that the very hour, the very moment that Jesus said the words, thy son liveth. Guess what? The son lived. My friends, I'm here to tell you, you can take Jesus at his word. You can take it to the bank. You can take it to the bank. If he said it, that settles it. I used to say it like this. I heard it said this. And I used to say it all the time. If God said it, I believe it, that settles it. But you know what I've learned? It doesn't matter whether I believe it or not. If he said it, that settles it. I, there's just nothing to do with me. It had nothing to do with this man. He simply made a petition. He said, Lord, would you do this? And he says, yes, go, your son lives. Wow, I just find it remarkable. He received this good news. And as a result, he himself and himself believed and his whole house. You see the testimony, because this man exhibited just this faith in the Lord, he took Jesus at his word. He went back and guess what he did? He told his servants about it. He told his wife about it. He told his kids about it. He said, let me tell you what happened. I took the walk. It took me about three, four, five hours. I don't know how long it took him. He said, I found Jesus. I asked him. He said this. I did this. He's now living. And they went, this must be. You know what's sad today? Many Christians receive the miracle, but they never tell anyone about it. That's sad, eh? The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord, what? Say so. Say so. We should be telling people. I do it all the time at home. I go, hey, kids, guess what God just did? And you share a blessing with them. Hey, guess what? Look what the Lord just did. Look, look I, we, I'll tell you, we, we, you know, the church has been so gracious to me and, and, and was able to help, help our family. So I'm able to, uh, to, to cut, you know, to, to uh, uh, you know, put my notice in there at work and be able to focus on some soul winning and some things that I need to do. You know what I did? I went home and said, let me tell you kids what God did. And go, wow, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, because that's the God I serve. That's the God you serve. We need to transmit that to those around us. I think people go, they, they, you, ever get, you ever get a sideways, maybe, maybe it's just me. I know Crystal can relate to this. You know, you're at work and something good happens and you just, just out of instinctively go, praise the Lord. And they're like, pulpit pounder. Well, no, praise the Lord for it. It's okay. Listen, you can say praise the Lord at your workplace. What are you praising the Lord for? Let me tell you what the Lord did. Amen. Sell a house. Amen. Praise the Lord. What do you mean praise the Lord? Hey, God just did that. I'm telling you what, you just, we can, we can give God. This is all this man did. He said, let me tell you what God did. Hey, look what Jesus said this. And man, his whole house believed. Don't let the world make you afraid to say praise the Lord. Say it anyway. They might look at you, make, make fun of you. But you know what? They'll never forget you. I'll never forget you. Give them a hallelujah every now and then. Really throw them off. That'll really, praise the Lord is one thing. A hallelujah, they're just, they don't know what to do with you. 
<laughs> Try it this week. Let me know how it goes. You know, something good happens. Don't just wait for something really. I mean, just, man, you go, hallelujah. They'll be like, whoa, hey, what do you got in your coffee? You know, like, what, what's, what's he got you motivated here? This is incredible. I mean, but I'm just saying, you know, if God's been good to you, tell someone about it. You know what's really neat? Tell a lost person about it. Let me tell you what my God did for me this week. Hey, that's a great soul winning starter, amen? Let me tell you what God did. Let me tell you what the Lord's doing in my life. I'm just telling you, he shared the good news, verse 54, and we'll close. This again is the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. Look, there was a great salvation in this house. This is the second miracle that Jesus did, and guess what? People are being saved. I think it's time the world hears just how good our God is. They accuse him of some pretty terrible things. Has anyone ever maybe accused someone that you love of something, you know, terrible that they didn't do and you came to their defense, didn't you? Sure you did. Can you think of a time maybe someone accused your child, maybe you, your husband, a friend, you go, you would not believe, and you go, that is not at all what happened. Let me tell you what happened. Look, when someone badmouths our Savior, well, if God was such a good God, you know, why? Well, let me tell you what he did. God is such a good God that he came and he died and was tortured to death, buried and rose again so you can have forgiveness of sins. Let me tell you how good my God is. Let me tell you, he didn't, he didn't send an angel, he didn't send a man, he came himself to die for you. Don't tell me my God is evil, he's uncaring. What else could he do? What good if God said, you know, I know what I'll do for mankind. I'll cure every one of their diseases. They'll live disease-free and then die and spend an eternity in hell. Now that's an unloving God. He said, I understand it might get a little rough here on earth. You might suffer from a COVID. You might suffer from a plague. But I'll tell you what, I got a cure that'll give you eternity in heaven with me. He said, listen, I'll take the cure for eternity then a temporal cure to live disease-free. Give me COVID, but don't take my Jesus. Dear Christian, God is not unrighteous and God is not a mean God. When they tell you, well, if God really loved this world, he'd get rid of COVID. He said, no way. Let me tell you how much God loved this world. He came himself and died so you can have COVID-free living for all eternity. Well, if God was so loving, he'd give us a vaccine. He did give us a vaccine. It's called his blood. And it takes us to heaven when it's applied in our hearts. Don't let people badmouth our God. Don't let people say, well, if he this, if he that. No, they're looking for an experience to prove and taunt God. He already did everything. Hey, listen, I'd rather suffer for 80 years on this earth and live forever with him than to live like a rich man. I'd rather have Jesus than anything you can take my gold you can take my silver but you can't take my jesus i'm here to tell you this man just exhibited some great faith and he told someone about it and they got saved and this is the second miracle that jesus did what a great thought as we think about this man changed the course of his family changed his course because he did what he simply took Jesus at his word and acted upon it. I want to be a person of great faith. Then just believe what Jesus said. Believe what this book is. And I'm here to tell you, it's an amazing and it's an amazing thought. I'm so glad you were able to join with us. Let me ask you this. Do you have Jesus? Do you have Jesus? Do you know Jesus? I'm not saying, do you know about Jesus? I'm here to tell you do, you, know, do you know the distance between heaven and hell? It's 18 inches between your head and your heart. That's what it is. A lot of people know about Jesus. Bible scholars know about Jesus. But I don't think they know Jesus. There are a lot of people tell you a lot of facts about Jesus. But they don't know Jesus. I'm here to tell you, today you can know Jesus. You can know Jesus because he wants to be known. You can know Jesus because he came for you. If you're watching this and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I would encourage you uh, to, uh, to, you can go on our website. You can go to obbc.ca forward slash know Jesus. It's on your screen there. 
But you can right now, you can, you can understand that your sin is the disease, not COVID-19. Your sin is the disease. Jesus is the cure. The Bible says that your sin is going to cost you. It's going to cost you death. But Jesus said that if any man come unto him, he will give life. Because he is life. He is the giver of life. And he died so that we might have life. You see, what did Jesus do for you? What is the good news today? That Jesus came, died, was buried, and rose again so you could have the forgiveness of sins and live forever in heaven without any pain, any disease, any heartache, any sorrow. There's going to come a time when every tear is going to be wiped away. That's what Jesus offers. Don't look for something temporary and tempt the Lord thy God. And, and let, me just, let me just say this while I'm here. He is your God because you're going to stand before him someday and he's going to judge you someday and you will bow before him someday. It'd be much better to acknowledge him today as savior than to stand before him as judge. Are you saved? Do you know Christ? Dear Christian, are you living for the next experience or are you simply content with Jesus? Is he just your genie in a bottle? And when you get discouraged, you want him to do something to prove to you that he loves you? Or do we just sit with him and read about just how much he loves you and rest in the fact that Jesus is no liar? And what he says about you he means it. I'm glad he does give us blessings, amen? Every day, there's blessings. But there's an old movie quote there. I guess it's older now. And it was about this couple. What was it? Facing the giants. You know, they want to have a baby, right? And the husband says, hey, if God never gives us a baby, you still going to love him? If Jesus doesn't give you what you want and what you're praying for right now, you still going to love him? You still going to love him? If he says, no, I know, I know if I give you that, it's going to spoil you. Would you rest enough in Jesus to say, you know what, Lord, you know what's best? Or do we behave like spoiled children when they don't get their video games and throw a temper tantrum and yell and scream at their parents? That's not my kids, by the way. They're awesome. They really are. I got the best kids in the world. They're amazing. I'm just, I'm just asking you. Let's think about that. Let's apply what God is doing as we close in prayer. Heavenly Father, it's great to be in your house today. May you be honored and glorified. You're so good to us. Thank you for leaving this nobleman so that we can learn what great faith just simply took you at his word and acted upon it. May you be glorified today. See us back uh, on Wednesday as we continue on our prayer meeting, as we um, just are continuing uh, to love and honor you uh, in your word, as we learn on how to study the Bible, how to, get, how to get the most out of your word. May you be glorified, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for being with us. Thank you again. All of you for helping us reach our goal. Um, I'm expecting here in the next three to four weeks to have all the equipment in, and uh, hope to see you on Wednesday. May the Lord richly bless.